Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorreen Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Today we're continuing a show we started last week with Max Evans, uh, one of New Mexico's most beloved writers, and we're talking today about his new book, Going Crazy with Sam Peckinpah and All Our Friends. Well, you were a very good friend to Sam Peckinpah, weren't you? Almost a quarter of a century, yes, ma'am. Well, he, as uh, f film progresses, he, he rises in stature as one of the best directors America has ever produced. And you knew him. This memoir, Going Crazy with Sam Peckinpah, has the most f tantalizing, it's enthralling. These are true stories, behind-the-scenes stories of your life with a director, Peckinpah. Tell me how y he first became aware of you or you became aware of him. Well, I had a very young agent, and I, as I was a young writer, beginning agent and a beginning writer, and uh, he called and all excited and said, the hottest director in the world wants to see you out here, and I wonder why, what does he want to see me about? And uh, who is he? And he said, Sam Peckinpah, and I had no idea who he was. He'd just gotten famous suddenly by a picture that had been thrown away in Hollywood called Ride the High Country, uh, and it was a huge hit in France. They stood around in the box, uh, all the way around several blocks to get in that film. And when Hollywood finally caught on, then it became a hit and he became famous. So that's uh, the concept. Well, what he wanted to see me about was my second novel, The High Low Country. And he had uh, read it in the manuscript form, handed to him by an associate that worked for him, Joe Bernard, uh, who became a writer later. And uh, by golly, I said, if you send me a ticket, uh, I rode the train in those days. I'd, I didn't ride a plane for a long, long time. And I'll come out and meet him. But he expressed his interest with a very interesting sentence. After he read The High Low Country, he said... Uh, I just want to meet the SOB who wrote that book. <laughs> that was you. And so you went out and met him. Yes. And uh, obviously made a very solid connection. Well, our, our connection was a, tra a transitional period that he loved when the automobile was just coming into the, to the world. He remembered that happening when he was a little kid on his grandfather's ranch. And that was part of our friendship was because his grandfather was a rancher and a judge, and I had a, a grandfather who was a rancher and a judge. And that sort of uh, tied us together immediately. We had something in, totally in common. Well, yeah. you write a lot about the transition of, of, of the West. I just want to say, in high-low country, for example, when the uh, the male protagonists come back from the war. It the, their home ranch and hometowns are going from the cowboy on a horseback to the pickup truck cowboy. Yes, and that was a period I've spent my whole life trying to uh, reveal as almost a history, and hardly anyone did it. I'm glad I did. Yeah, because there's literally tens of thousands of Western books, some of them very fine around the world, but. Hardly, hardly any about that period. Well, uh, so I want to give a little of your background in film because uh, over 50 years ago you wrote a book called The Rounders that was made into a wonderful movie with, with Henry Fonda and Glenn Ford. And uh, your movie High Low Country, although Peckinpah was not able to realize it as a film, Stephen Frears did, and it was much beloved in New Mexico as one of our best New Mexico movies. You also worked with Governor Cargo to help establish the New Mexico Film Commission. So you have film credentials that are unmatched, really, in the state. Thank you for what you did in bringing so much film work here. Well, I'm so happy it worked and there. It's being continued. Yes. So one of the problems when we talk about film is that we're talking, and we're on film, but, but you don't get a sense 
of, of what a great director does or what a great actor does. Last week, and I encourage our audience to go to reportfromsantafe.com in case they missed it on air, we did some clips of some of Peckinpah's most famous movies, The Wild Bunch, Ride the High Country, The Battle, Ballad of Cable Hope, which stars you, which you, you act in. And no, um, I, I was in uh, a different film. That was the film that really t- uh, tore, tore his life up. Major Dundee. Oh, good. I was in the Battle of the Cable Hole. Yes, you were. But let's let's go right to Major Dundee, and um, so <coughs> Charlton Heston starred in it, and we're going to show a, a small clip that has Richard Harris, Santa Berger, and Charlton Heston in it, and this is just an, a kind of atmospheric scene, and then I want you to tell us. Was it his major epic, and if it wasn't, why? But let's just take a minute and look at Charlton Heston, Santa Berger, and Richard Harris in Major Dundee. Let's look at it. Sergeant, I want to talk to the mayor. Quien habla por el pueblo? Quien habla por el pueblo? Quien habla por el pueblo? There seems to be no end to it. What did you say? We've been attacked by Apaches, by local bandits, by freebooters from Texas. Then liberated by the French, and now United States cavalry. Unfortunately, you came too late. We have nothing to give you. No food, no guns, no women. That is what you want, isn't it? That's why you come here without flying your country's brave flag. Are you speaking for these people? You're not Mexican, are you? My husband was the doctor of this village. But he was also the doctor for the war Easters. He died there, where they did. I've paid for my place here. Well, I'm sorry for that, man, but we've come a long way. I need fresh horses and food. My men are hungry. They are no more hungry than this village. Mr. Sistemus, comida y cobayas. Perdón, señor, no tenemos nada. Los franceses nos robaron todo. They are willing to share everything they have got with you, Major. Most particularly, their hunger. Would you like to see the children in our dispensary, whose sickness is starvation? Then a Graham fire! Sergeant Gomez slaughtered two mules. Distribute the meat and whatever stores you find in that blockhouse to the people of the village, to this lady. Teresa. Teresa Gertner Santiago. Ma'am. Um, Ryan. Yes, sir. Much gusto, senora. Lieutenant. Well, there, there you have it. My goodness, don't they look young and handsome. Charlton Hessen. T- tell me what happened, what he did. Uh, the studios wanted to to mess with Peckinpah's vision, and what did Charlton do? He did. He uh, he offered to give his entire salary up so Sam could could continue with the film in his in his own manner, his own dream, his own talent, and they turned him down. Uh, also, it wasn't all roses. Uh, he got so mad at Sam that he charged him horseback with a, a real sword and took a swipe at him. <laughs> and all the crew got between the horse and Sam and, and Heston, or he probably would have killed him. Well, this is the man who parted the Red Sea. So when Charlton Heston is coming at you, you, you better get out of the way. Not only that, but a horseback and a big sword. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, fortunately, we have available to us, this is Major Dundee. They were able to put together the original director's cut so that now our audience can go and see the vision that Peckinpah had. Yeah, it destroyed his life, uh, actually. That's what started him on his his destructive force within himself. Because from the time he was a little kid, he had dreamed of making this in the film. He just knew someday he would, and it would be his, his classic of all time, his masterpiece. And they, were, they, were, they were, weren't accepting his cut at all. And in fact, he got in a, a, such a strong fight with the producer, Jerry Bresser, over it, that he cut 25 minutes out and burned it. So it could never oh be restored. Oh my gosh! And right in the middle of the film, it broke Sam's heart. 
He tore him up emotionally, and uh, the only vengeance he got, he invited Brester to the set and uh, met him in the hotel and, and faked the, uh, kindness towards him and then pulled his pants down and, left, and went off and left him in the lobby of the airport hotel, in the hotel there, combined airport and hotel. Well, <laughs> you know, that's one of the stories in your book, Going Crazy with Sam Peckinpah. Yeah. These are, you know, it, it was go the golden era of Hollywood and the characters, the personalities. That was quite an amazing thing. But as a result of that, he had to go to England for, to make, when he made Straw Dogs. Yes, he did. And uh, he, that happened, that picture, he, he liked that picture and, and worked on that script. Uh, because of his uh, total admiration of uh, Audrey, who did, had done the two books, Territorial Imperative. And they inf I had read them at the same time. Sam and I had talked a great deal about it and uh, how much we loved it, how much we believed it. He believed it to the point that uh, he turned that entire picture into uh, uh, like a little sparrow sacrificing his life to a ha at a hawk coming to get the little birds. And, and where Dustin Hoffman finally, with, with the pressure of people offending and attacking his family, he finally broke down from a gentle, kind person into a raging maniac to protect his own. And that's where the violence started. And it came from Robert Ardrey's uh, book, Territorial Imperative, which influenced Sam's life. Right. I remember I read Territorial Imperative at the time, but we're going to take a little look at this. This is uh, Straw Dogs, filmed in, in England, starring Dustin Hoffman and Susan George. And we're going to show the clip where Dustin, as a mild-mannered mathematician, is under threat from people in the village. His wife mm -hmm. is being threatened. And in this clip that we're going to see, he steps up. He goes from the pacifist to the man as in territorial imperative defending his home. Let's look at Dustin Hoffman and Susan George for a moment. I'm going to keep them out of this house. Please! Please! Come on! Shut your mouth! Shut it. I can hold them off. Now don't worry, someone will show up. Dick! suggest you get out of the way of the windows. I also suggest that you turn the rest of the lights on upstairs. Do we have any wire? I told you I won't help you. I see. Why don't you entertain Niles? Well, that is very, very powerful. Very powerful. But you just see him, and then he comes up with all these diabolical ways to beat the people that are attacking him. But but this is what was this one of the only non westerns that Peck and Paw did? No, he did several. Osterman Weekend, uh, Convoy oh, that's was right. halfway, a western halfway not. Yeah, and uh, several others, Killer Elite. That's right. I don't know. I'm so so drawn to 
to the Westerns. There's one other Western that we're going to look at because it's, it's like the sweetest, most, most perfect movie. It's Steve McQueen in uh, Junior Bonner. And this, uh, with Robert Preston and Ida Lupino, the scene that we're going to look at, and this is the perfect story about the transitional West, because um, uh, Steve McQueen and his dad are old school cowboy rodeoing. This is, tell me about rodeo in this film. Well, it, uh, it was a real thing. They tried to, to, to utilize it, but uh, both of them were failures, no matter how many rodeos they'd won. The money was gone, the father, and he wanted more for his son. And when he finally didn't didn't get it he, in, in, in the scene that I think impresses most people is when he, towards the end, when he asked him, his father, they're, they're, they're parting, he's telling him goodbye, and he asked, asked the son for a loan. That's right. Well, actually, let's just take a moment and look at that. This is Robert Preston playing Ace Bonner. Steve McQueen as Junior Bonner sitting on a bench by in Prescott, Arizona, uh, talking about can the father ask the son for help. Let's look at that. Well, I hear you're doing very well. Where'd you hear that? Taking care of Mom, are you? Oh, not much. She's selling antiques out the townhouse. She's happy. She's living right where she wanted to live all her life. Right in the middle of things. Curly's gonna sell that house. Put her in a curio shop. Curly's doing right well. Junior. I'm going to Australia. What are you gonna do? Hunt kangaroos? <laughs> Gold for the finding, that's what. 150,000 square miles to prospect. And sheep, merino, finest wool in the world. I already made the down payment. How'd you like to come down there with me? Yeah, I know you can't make it. Not a big rodeo star. But at least you could grub stake your dad. I'd make you partner number one, Junior. Partner number one. Now, what do you say to that? Oh, something I got to tell you. Oh, no, something I got to tell you about mining. There's a lot to learn. Rare metals. Big future. I'm busted, Ace. Of course, you never tried your hand at prospect. Busted? Better in a tire. Well, there it is. At the end, he, in frustration, he just knocks his son's hat off. And, uh, you know, Steve McQueen says, I'm, I'm busted. Flatter than a tire, a flat tire. And then he goes on to win some money and, and is able to help his father. But it's a dynamic because the other brother is selling mobile homes and totally transforming the West, having these canned fake Western shows. And, and this is a theme that, that you have explored so much in your work and that Peckinpah really just makes a jewel of a film with Junior Bonner. Well, that particular scene, let's, let's go back to yeah. that. Uh, the screenwriter Jeb Rosebrook was a very, very fine screenwriter. But he, when the, they were having that scene together about both of them actually having to admit they were broke, and he just slapped his uh, Steve's hat off. That was invented. Sam invented that on the on the motion. Right oh, really? It was not in the script. It worked magnificently. Yeah. It, it added enormously to the film because that's what his grandfather did to him. He said when he was a kid, instead of spanking him or anything else, the hat was the proud thing he, uh, of all the people that worked with cattle, and he would slap his hat. And that was his punishment when he would goof up. And it came to him. You see the influence that I've talked about of his grandfather on the ranch? Well, there it was. In, in a great film, in my mind, the finest rodeo film ever made. Um, tell me a few of, the, of your adventures with director Pep Kempa, with Sam Pep Kempa, your friend. 
You talk you, in the book. These stories are so good. You talk about a time when you were at a party at his house and he pushed you fully dressed into the pool. F- tragic flaw being that you don't swim. Well, uh, I had a visitor that had taken me, driven me to to meet Sam uh, from Dallas, Texas. Perry Nichols, a very fine man, fine artist. He's long gone now, but I I thought he and Sam would get along. They did. They respected one another, and so we were at his house, and he decided we'd go down in Malibu to Holiday House and have some drinks, and we were just having a grand time. Everybody respected everybody else's work. We were all professionals in what we did. We were all sort of crazy, and everything was going beautifully, and we left that uh, bar that night to go out to our cars, and we had to walk to the swimming pool. Now, Sam knew that I couldn't swim, and he pushed me in that pool, and and uh, as I hit the water, I thought, my God, my my best friend here in Hollywood just try, is trying to drown me, and I I was sinking, and I thought, well, I'm going to drown. I have to make one tremendous jump, and that'll be it. My boots were filling up with water, and it was really a jump. I just barely made it, and I got both hands on the edge of the pool. And I'll be darned if Sam didn't kick one of my hands loose. And there I'm hanging by one hand. And I thought, if I somehow I'll make it if I can just hold just a second. But I, but I was certain he would kick my other uh, hand loose. And I was done. Yeah. Literally done. And Perry had, Nichols was, wasn't very big. He's only about Sam's size. But he was very strong. And he had grabbed him and pulled him back from the pool. And I somehow gathered the strength and got out of the pool. Then we go home. We go to, we go down. Everything seemed to be fine, except I, I uh, uh, when we got in there, I said, Sam, I was I was still choking. Yeah. The water was hurting my lungs. I had torn a rib and cartilage completely loose. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? I didn't know. And I said, shall we have another drink? I had spotted an ashtray there with several cigarettes in it. So uh, believe it or not, he said, oh, sure. Wasn't paying him a lot of attention. And I just poured every kind of booze he had, uh, mixed it all up in that ashtray that was behind his bar and handed it to him. I couldn't believe it that he didn't study what I had handed him, but he took a big drink of it. And then I said to him, just as he swallowed swallowed that that wondrous cocktail I'd made for him, I said, Sam, you tried to drown me. You tried to kill me. And he admitted it. And he said, you you were selling, you had talked to Perry Nichols about selling my book, The Great Wedding, to Gene Kelly in the morning. And I did have a meeting the next day with Gene Kelly about this book. Well, he seemed to... Think he hadn't bought that book. He, he didn't own that book at that time. But in his mind, he owned all my works. And he'd gone into a rage, and it flipped him over that I was deceiving him. So I had no choice. I thought, well, I'm going to break his neck. There's nothing else left to do with a human like this. And I had per- made one sad mistake. I'd forgotten that he had been in the Marine Corps. Ah. So you know right where he kicked me. Oh, Boom. And it weakened me to a great deal. And instead of lifting him way above my head and bring, bringing him down and breaking his neck like a dry stick, I could just barely get him up about chest high. So I put him as hard as I could towards the floor, which wasn't very hard. It's just a drop, really. But he was screaming and couldn't get up. He tried to stand up, and he started screaming. He said, he said Max, you broke my leg. And I, I never will forget that, nor, nor will he, wherever he is, down or up, or wherever he is this moment, because he will remember that I walked over and patted him on top of the head and apologized profusely. I told Sam Peckinpah that I was very, very sorry that I meant to break his cockeyed neck. Right, you apologized for breaking his leg because you meant to break his cockeyed neck. Yes. 
Yes. Well, we're speaking today with Max Evans. These stories and many, many more are in Going Crazy with Sam Peckinpah. Um, I want to just kind of go out. We'll leave the show. The, you, he had you acting in the Ballad of Cable Hogue with Jason Robards and Slim Pickens. We're just going to look as we as we leave our the show today at you riding shotgun with Slim Pickens on the stagecoach in a movie called The Ballad of Cable Hogue. And if you don't mind my saying, you upstage both Jason Robards and Slim Pickens in this. I do mind it, but I can't do anything about it. No, no. So I want to thank you so much, Max Evans, for all of your writing and your wonderful glimpse in this memoir into a, a, a world that has made America what it is today. So thank you very much, Max Evans. It's been an honor to talk to you and to talk about my old friend and the world's friend, old Sam Peckinpah. And I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Something the matter? Why are we stopping? Are we in trouble? He is. We ain't. Nice evening, fellas. You're a long way from home. I'm halfway to hell and looking for help. You got her, Pilgrim. You've fallen among good hands, my friend. The gospel says, do unto others. You want to ride in? He can ride in sight with us. Matthew chapter 2, verse Uh, 3. Daniel, are you sure? Shh. Hold you never to question my judgment. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. John chapter 5, verse 13. I have never questioned your judgment. In the 26 years of our marriage, blessed by a devotion to the cause of the Lord, I have never questioned your judgment, but I am now. It seems ridiculous to sit in the middle of the desert watching men drink. We're near halfway in. How about $3? Well, if sugar were two cents a barrel, I couldn't afford a pinch of salt or an egg to put it on. I was robbed about five days back. Robbed? Robbed? Robbery, did you say? Where? Did you say? They nailed me out there on the flats, ma'am. They took everything I had. Mister, you're damn lucky to be alive. Your language is disgusting. Both of you. Hell, we know that. Well, more profanity. Shoot, partner. Crawl on up. You can ride for nothing. Despicable, of course. But what do you expect me to do? I expect you to take action. I think we should leave. Will you please? Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.